Okay, so welcome to you all. And um, where to start, eh? Um, may, maybe to start with, I'll just say um, how important I think it is that we do come together in these various ways particularly at this time and uh, want to thank uh, the British Centre online for providing this opportunity for me to um, have the privilege of doing this um, retreat and um, creating this space where we can all come together and practice together. I'm particularly, um, I was particularly pleased to see that this um, retreat was offered free to people. So I think this is so important that people can come and participate in things like this in, in the Dharma and, and come together and create these kind of virtual sanghas, these virtual communities. It's so lovely that we've got all these people from all over the place. Uh, I've been doing a lot of Zoom, but they, most of the Zoom things I do are, 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 are geographically more limited. So this is particularly lovely to have people from well, city places that I've been and I've kind of got a sense of them, like Sydney and Thames and places in America and of course there's places I haven't been to. So. Anyway, it's, it's really great. And um, so I would say to you, the work they do, I think it's always been important to provide this kind of central online space for the whole of the uh, Sri Ratna movement. But it's particularly important at this time. And I think it's particularly important that they're able to provide this um, free of charge for those of you that really can't afford um, and I know it's a difficult economic time for a lot of us so that's fantastic but I would say you know if you can um, afford to give please, please do support their work because it's important I think for us both as a movement and maybe more broadly I don't I've just got this sense at the moment that it is important that people are in relationship, you know, particularly people that are orientated towards trying to make a positive difference in the world, you know, that they feel supported and come together. So anyway, I believe that. Um, I was thinking uh, this morning, I wanted to make a sort of very simple but important point really that what we've been doing uh, this last week shouldn't be seen as a kind of replacement for the practices that you've already learned and you've already been um, practicing maybe for years. Um, I see it more as a kind of supplement or perhaps a way of adding a, a little bit more depth to the way you might approach the mindfulness of breathing or the metagardener or whatever practice. So I don't, I, all of the work I've done over the last, uh, I suppose it's going on for 40 years now as a meditation teacher, all of this for me has stemmed from those basic practices. Yeah. Just trying to kind of draw out the richness of a practice like the mindfulness of breathing. Um, so everything we've done in a way has stemmed from those basic practices and I don't think they need replacing. Uh, but I do think um, 
we need to approach them in a kind of imaginative and open way. Yeah. So I'm not necessarily expecting people to um, do what we've done here in their own practice, but I hope it will inform your practice in some way, in a useful way. Okay. I'm aware that we haven't really completed our alchemical journey. Maybe it was a bit am ambitious to think we would. One of the main um, characteristics of alchemy was the repetition of it. You know, things needed to be processed, if you want to use that word, circulated, calcified, evaporated, all these uh, kind of words come into alchemy can be sort of translated imaginatively into sort of particular psychological or psychophysical processes. Um, so alchemy is essentially a circulation, it's a circular affair in a way, things are repeated again and again and again. Um, and when I was thinking of this, I think, well, actually, Sangharatta, our founder, was actually always very clear that the spiritual path was a spiral path. And of course, on a spiral path, we are repeating the same thing. Uh, again and again and again, but hopefully they, well, we probably think of the spiral as going upwards, don't we? Because we've got this rather um, ascending uh, archetype in the Western tradition. I'm not quite sure that it is there so much in the Eastern tradition. It's certainly not there so much in Taoist and even the past of Buddhism that were heavily influenced by Taoism, like Chan Buddhism, Zen Buddhism. But anyway, um, I suppose I think of it as a deepening, really. We're spiraling around, but as we do so, we're deepening. We're going more and more towards some kind of authentic self or authentic way of being in the world to use that word, um, coming more into our center. Yeah. Just very briefly then, you know, there's two, you know, we there's two sort of stages that we haven't really talked about. That's the yellowing and then the reddening, the rubido. Sometimes the yellowing is left out. Um, the dangers, as I was saying last night, the dangers of the silvering or the albedo, this whitening where we kind of establish a witness. I suppose you could say that's the establishment of a witness consciousness. Um, we, we've got a reflective consciousness which is no longer reacting to the material in a judgmental or I was going to say paranoid way, you know, but we were so sort of, it becomes accepted. Even I think last night I said, I don't know when I said it, but I was saying, you know, perhaps that's some equivalent of the idea of the mirror like wisdom that we find in Buddhism. Um, in the yellow, in the danger of that is a kind of detachment, yeah, a kind of indifference. Yeah, we've to some extent alleviated the grosser aspects of our own suffering and that we're not reacting to things in the same way, that we, we're not um, trying to move away or avoid. We're sitting with, we've learned to sit with, if you like, and, we, and actually we get confidence from this sitting with, because after a while we to find actually we can um, sit with this material that before we would have shied away from that or denied or covered in some way or other. Um, but as I say, the danger is a kind of detachment or even 
a kind of inflation where actually the ego, though very active, becomes inflated. This is quite a common thing in uh, all spiritual traditions, actually. Even a very, um, is, well, I, I probably don't even have to go into that. I'm sure we're all aware of the, the dangers of uh, appropriating what seems to be inside. Um, and uh, the person then suffers from a kind of inflation. They might even think now beyond everybody else or above everybody else and no longer need to worry about their ethical behavior or that. And um, anyway, I won't go into that because I'm sure you can all try to fill in the, the um, gaps as well. Uh, and the yellow in is, 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 a, is a kind of what remains of um, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a kind of thickening, it's a kind of beginning to come. That there's still a kind of greed out there. The actual whitening experience, I've had this experience, can't, can't see um, It's very hard to see. Um, I don't know how to put it in words actually, but anyway, the yellowing is, is, is when, when, when we, uh, when the uh, inflation, if there is an inflation or the, the, uh, the, um, The indifference, if you like, I don't know, not quite the right word, but you know, this, this idea, well, well, I'm not affected by anything anymore. You know, things don't affect me. I, I'm, I'm, um, when, when the Negrido elements sort of recognize the still there, actually, the still there. Um, and then the, Rubido is a kind of maturation. In the actual alchemical opus, I mean, it's very difficult to talk about an alchemical opus because one of the things about the alchemical um, path is that no two alchemists really ever agree about it. About it. You know, they all have their own slightly different take on what it is, what's going on, and the symbols they might use are, are different. Um, in this sense, they could be understood as a kind of poetic tradition. In that sense, it's a kind of poetic tradition, you know, that they're kind of writing or uh, involved in the same things, but they all do it in a slightly different way. Um, which again, I think, is how meditation is. You know, we're all sort of aiming at the same broad principles of developing awareness and kindness and insight. But it's always going to be done in a slightly different way because you're a slightly different, your psyche, though your psyche kind of might well, and I believe it does, have elements of um, the collective psyche or even the world psyche, if you can use that, that expression. Um, it will be individual to you, you know, how, how you experience the uh, spiritual path is going to be to some degree at least individual to you. Um, but uh, one of the very common um, images we get in alchemy is the uh, sacred marriage. This is often shown as the king and the queen coming together. Um, you get a lot of very bizarre images in alchemy. You often get them sitting in a bar together. It was quite funny, right? we, we had Hackwin's uh, bath, didn't we? 
anyway, you have them sitting sort of opposite in the bath together, and they're being heated up actually. The bath water's being um, heated from underneath, and they're sitting naked apart from their crown in the, in the bath. And this is sort of the coming together in a way. This is uh, to some extent uh, the uh, well, in the way we've been looking at it, I suppose we could say it's, it's coming together for cooperation between the height and the depth, or the kind of rational and the irrational that they start, they come into relationship with one another, they come into union with one another. And from that union, uh, and this is really the rubido stage or the uh, completion, if you like, from that union, a third uh, person, a son usually, appears. Um, sometimes, um, well, normally actually, so it's not quite clear how this necessarily fits in, but you also get the, um, from the union, you, you also get quite often a hermaphrodite or even a monoped or one-legged um, symbol of a one-legged person of a central single leg monoped or an hermaphrodite. So you get a kind of um, over, it's quite interesting from the modern perspective, isn't it? Because now we're, we're really beginning to reassess the sort of gender and all this uh, in alchemy that this uh, hermaphrodite on the monoped was, uh, was um, seen as a um, quite a developed stage in this process. But you also get the sun being born, the, the um, sun in the sense of a uh, male child, or, which is in quite often quite a Christ-like figure, actually. Um, and of course, the I think this is common, but not that I'm, you know, that he, uh, well, no, I won't even say that. I'm not a huge fan of Christianity, but I won't say that. Well, I have said that myself. But anyway, it's, it's quite interesting that in, in a way, both Christ and um, the Buddha, I think what they remembered for is their engagement with their society, with their culture. And uh, this um, this sun uh, is then coming fully back into the world and has a kind of redemptive uh, role within the world itself. I think I mentioned this way back actually when I was talking about Haddo, the, the French philosopher, who done all this work on the nature of the sage. He said the defining characteristic of the sage is that they always bear the world in mind. And of course, we get this in the Buddhist tradition with the development of the Bodhisattva. Um, so, what makes the uh, Buddha a Buddha is not that he got enlightened, he did get enlightened, but that's not what makes him a Buddha. What makes him a Buddha is that after his enlightenment, he's, um, and I was saying this last night, it does seem to be slightly after. Although um, after his enlightenment, he decides that um, he's going to spend the rest of his life um, teaching the Dharma, teaching this to other people. And um, and this is really what makes him the Buddha. Yeah, this 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 life dedicated to being in service to the world, you know, being in service to the world. But as a shift from a, it's an interesting thing, isn't it, for us? You know, why did we get involved in Buddhism? What was it that we wanted when we got involved in 
Buddhism. And uh, I think most people get involved in Buddhism, and it's obviously totally legitimate because to some extent they want to relieve their own suffering. You know? They feel out of place in the world or whatever it might be. They, they want to, they want to um, find individual kind of happiness. But at some point, for this for the completion to take place, there has to be a fundamental shift in being involved in it because you want something out of it. To be involved in it because you're in service to something larger than you. Uh, I mean, in a way, this logically has to be the case because so long as we're still doing it primarily for ourselves, we are still to some extent caught up in this ego, small mind, isn't it? We're still caught up in the small mind. And uh, what we're trying to do really is reluctant to say this because it's a bit complicated and I haven't really, we're not complicated, but I haven't really got the time to completely unfold it, but when we, when we uh, move this, one of the things we've been looking at and I've been trying to emphasize, I hope it's got over throughout the week, is that in a way, there needs to be a, a movement in where we imagine and, and experience our centre, where we where are we centred. And um, I've been suggesting that this movement needs to be into the heart. And um, of course, I'm really using heart metaphorically. Although, although energetically it's useful to have a physical location for it. Yeah? So it doesn't exclude the kind of physical heart, but obviously I'm using it poetically, you know, don't. Um, and I, I very briefly mentioned at some point, you know, about how the heart is, a, is in most spiritual districts, Traditions understood as the um, seat of the imagination, and and that this uh, is um, it is an organ in in a lot of traditions. It's understood as an organ of perception. Yeah, that knowledge of the world comes in through the heart. Particularly qualitative knowledge of the world. I've become quite uh, fascinated with uh, shamanic traditions and uh, one of the things that um, I was reading the other day, uh, this book, in, uh, with uh, there was this anthropologist that's gone down into Peru. It was a serious sort of book, you know. Anyway, it's an anthropologist. He's, he's gone down to Peru. He's studying their medicine, you know, studying their plant. I think this was probably in the 60s or something. And um, he found out that these, these people were using these incredibly uh, sophisticated combinations of different plants get different effects and, and and he was fascinated he wanted to know from these people and said to him well how how did you know that if you put that with that and that and did that to look at this result how did you know that and um they just kept saying to him the plants tell us the plants tell us and uh, they claimed that they had direct communication with the plant, which from a kind of modern Western tradition seems uh, 
rather unlikely claim. Um, in the end, they persuade him to participate in the, some of their... Well, they don't persuade him. He keeps asking this question and they say to him at some point, well, if you want to know, you're going to have to participate in our mysteries sort of thing. Um, and uh, interesting enough, of course, we do have this tradition in the West. It's not. It's not just uh, in, to be found in a uh, Siberia or the Amazon rainforest. We, we have this tradition in the West. Interestingly, Goethe, who you know, famous as a poet and a playwright, uh, was also um, very, very um, interested in plants and medicine. And, and uh, he was part of this tradition, this direct knowing. Another, another example of course, the bark flower remedies. And um, you know, some of you might be aware that that tradition is, is very uh, alive in places like Finholm, where they uh, have this experience of being able to communicate, or you know, they're open to direct communication from the vegetative world or nature, you know. And some of us might have poetically uh, over this lockdown had this experience of going out and coming more uh, strongly into relationship and communication with uh, the environment, maybe a particular tree, your favourite tree. I live right in the middle of London, but funny enough, I go to the end of my road, which is about 50 yards, and turn right. Another 50 yards, <clears throat> so about 100 yards away. I've got this grove of, um, there was five, one of them has died, but um, one of them was, looked like he'd been sick for a long time, and I tried to finally put it down, but there's, uh, there's only four left now, but now in a kind of circle. And it's just on the it's just on the uh, uh, corner of two major roads. So it's quite a big bit of paper, and they've they planted. Now quite big trees now. They've planted uh, these redwood trees. There's a little grove of redwood trees just at the end of my road in the middle of London. You know, and um, since I I've been living where I'm living for about six months, uh, six years. And um, I've slowly built up a real relationship with these trees. I won't say that communicate. Well, I do feel in communication with them, you know, and I do feel I can't really pass them these days without laying a hand on them. And I quite often sort of put a hand on them and just kind of stand there for a while, kind of sensing down into the earth through them. And the, I mean, I've got no idea whatsoever there in any sense or any way or way of me, but I'm certainly aware of them and, and, and it enriches my life usually. Yeah? Whenever I go away, I'm always really pleased to come back and greet them and be in relationship with them in some way or other. Um, and of course, funny enough, funny enough, they have found uh, now that when um, we go into a forest, I mean, the Japanese are big on this, they do this forest bathing, don't they? But when we're in the company of trees, it has a very positive, definite effect on our physiological state of being. You know? And they've also found that the organ, the organ that's most receptive the energetic field of trees or plants is the heart. In the human being, all animals are to some extent uh, sensitive to electromagnetic fields that uh, all life gives off. In some animals, they have a separate organ for this. Some fish have a completely separate organ that all it does is pick up electromagnetic fields. And they use it both for hunting and um, navigation and whatever. 
human beings, it's the heart, it's the heart that we that um, is sensitive to these fields. And these fields have a direct effect on the heart. We haven't had time to go into this in more detail. And I'm not sure that I'm qualified to go into it in more detail, but just to say that a heart is, they've also found that the heart now has a very strong regulatory role to play with brain activity. It releases hormones and chemicals which uh, affect the brain and the heart. Um, so it is the heart that quite literally connects us with, of course, we're connected to the um, natural world for all our senses, but we're connected to the natural world on an energetic sense through the heart, through the heart. So they found this out. So when once we start knowing these sort of things, perhaps isn't so ridiculous that we can have some kind of direct intuitive knowledge of the nature of plant. Anyway, there's a lot more to this than I've got time to talk about, but anyway. Oh, I was supposed to be talking. <laughs> Sorry, I've got distracted. I was supposed to be talking about the rubido. Well, the rubido, the reddening, is, is a sort of maturation, I suppose. It's a coming back into the world and a maturation probably largely through activity. Yeah, that what we've uh, experienced and what we've learned uh, in our practice, in our sitting practice, in our meditative practice, starts to flower in the world. And of course, this is, this is our life, isn't it? This reddening, this sort of coming into a deeper and deeper service to the world and a deeper and deeper relationship with the world. So it's the, this process of this uh, becoming inworldened, I sometimes think of it as, yeah, we become inworldened, we, 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 we we become more and more in, in touch with uh, the rest. Or I quite like this word, source. I think it's quite a dodgy word. We've got to be a bit careful. But I have been thinking about it lately as coming into relationship with the source of life, you know, the basic energetic nature of life, which, of course, flows through us, flows through all living things, and we participate in, and it's coming more and more, it's our lives becoming more and more informed by this, well, just, just yes, this um, life energy, and the nature of aliveness, the nature of being itself, and um, of course, just being in service to the world. And uh, of course, the less concerned we are for ourselves, the happier we tend to be. So there's no kind of contradiction between this and the overcoming of suffering. Really, in the end, we overcome suffering insofar as having experienced ourselves very deeply, we move from being self-concerned to being concerned for all being, all being. So this sort of hyperbolic um, oath of the Bodhisattva to the save all sentient beings starts to make sense to us. You know, this is our primary concern to be of service to the world. And Although it's not quite like that, is it? We just find ourselves doing that. We find that that's the way our life goes. Yeah. Rather than it being this stupid uh, thing, you know, it's just that we find through becoming more authentic ourselves, in some way, we come into a more intimate relationship with the world around us. 
in a more compassionate relationship. And this can be done in you know big way. Well, I say big or small, it's not big or small. It's just that we start being interested. You know, sometimes we have this. Sometimes for people having children will be a fundamental sort of impetus for this sort of shift. You know? Suddenly we've got something in the world that we love and care about uh, before ourselves. You know? Sometimes this sort of opening can come from just taking an interest in anything really, cooking, gardening, music, you know, it doesn't have to be, we don't all have to be um, Bob Geldorf or something, you know, we just, we just get on with our work, we just get on with our lives and our work, but we do so in an increasingly sort of soulful way. In, in a way that we are in connection with uh, this basic Buddhism, isn't it really? You know, we're spending all this time um, recognizing that we don't have a permanent separate self, but we are on some fundamental level, not discreet from the rest of reality, yeah. that we are uh, interpenetra interpenetrating, we're kind of porous. And of course, when we really realize it, it has these sort of consequences. Anyway. When we come more fully, more fully into our center, our heart, we are more fully in the world as well, of the world. It's quite a relief, I think, uh, in a way, the more, more we understand ourselves as the world manifesting as us, the easier life gets, I think, yeah. So many of us uh, go through life with a kind of us in the world, even in an antagonistic way, us against the world. But we are a world, you know, and that kind of um, extraordinary thing that the world or the universe is manifested in you, well, it's both extraordinary and completely every day, isn't it? How could it be otherwise? It's just how it is, you know. Reality is manifesting as you, and the more intimate you get, with your center, the more you find uh, comfort in the world, comfort. To comfort, kind of, fort means strength, and then comfort means to kind of live with strength. To be comfortable in the world. To live with strength in the world, you know, to feel your, well, not your potency, but the potency of the world flowing through you, the, the potency of life flowing through you. I've always found it really interesting that uh, when Siddhartha having uh, realized his. Um, ascetic practices were not going to lead to his liberation. He's set on the right track again by remembering something from his childhood, remembering himself under the rose apple tree.
And in a way, in a certain sense, I think all of us are trying to get back to a sort of way of being in the world that was there originally which uh so this whole process really um can be seen as a kind of uncovering this is one way we can see it as a sort of uncovering of something that's already there And the remembering. I think this is quite important that we don't necessarily feel we don't necessarily need to have big experiences. We've all had enough experience, I think. By the time we're adults, everything we kind of need is already there. It's just coming into relationship with it in a different way. At some point, as children, we were all um, open and lived in a world full of the divine, to use that term, you know, an enchanted world. We had the ability to sort of forget ourselves in a particular sort of way, in a positive sort of way, to forget ourselves. The Dogen says uh, to study the self is to forget the self. Anyway, let's find our breath and our bodies the animating life force. Which on one level is the breathing. Not a, well, the deeper level, on the deep level, I'm not sure if that's the, quite the right word, a more subtle level is a kind of alignment with the energetics of life. It's alignment we've been attempting through the posture so the posture is just an attempt to sort of come into a psychophysical alignment with the energetic nature of the world around us, as well as the internal kind of energetic and this level is kind of a bit like what we call in the Buddhism and Sambhoda Kaya, the body of bliss, is not quite material. It's not kind of pure spirit or emptiness. It's the middle realm, the imaginal realm. or the alchemical realm in the language we can use. This isn't something you can know intellectually. 
Dumping it down. But you can kind of relax into it. It's there. Let's relax the face and the legs. I've been stressing the importance of relaxing the legs. If you don't get anything else out of this week, I hope you get the idea of releasing in the legs. Allowing yourself to imagine a connection to the earth below you and allowing the sky above you to activate your posture, your energetic system in some way. Quite a nice day it looks like today in London. I'm imagining a bit of a blue sky above my head today. Rain has stopped. The clouds have drifted away. The sky is blue again. My soft face. And simple breath and keep it alive. Well, let's just sit with our experience, just sit with. Uh, whatever's happening for us. Not trying to fix ourselves or be better or these sort of ideas with self-improvement, just relaxing into whatever happens to be going on. Doing so with a Softening and opening body and heart, and the support of life itself, the world itself. Kind of trusting the world, trusting your own heart, breathing. Here's uh, David Wagoner's Lost. Stand still. Trees in front of you and the bushes beside you are not lost. Wherever you are, it is called here. And you must treat it as a powerful Prayer. Ask permission to know it and be known. Listen. The forest breathes. It speaks. I have made this place around you. If you leave it, you may come back again saying, Here. No two trees are the same for ravens. No two branches the same for wren. If what a tree or a bush does is lost to you, you are indeed lost. Stand still. The forest knows where you are. You must let it find you. So we're not in the forest, are we? But uh, 
let the world find you. Just sit still. Let the world find you. It's always entering you every time you breathe in and out. Let's sit in the world. Let the world find us.
just noticing what's happening. Maybe on the out breath, just have the simple idea of opening your awareness, just opening. In breath, simple idea of being available to the world, energetic, earth energy, sky energy, let it come in. The out breath. This opening, letting go into your thought, your Just let the face stop. And Lost. Ah. 
stand still. The trees in front of you and the bushes beside you are not lost. Wherever you are is called here. And you must treat it as a powerful stranger. Ask permission to know it and be known. Listen to five breathe. To speak. I have made this place around you. If you leave it, you may come back saying here. No two trees are the same for raven. No two branches the same for wren. If what a tree or a bush does is lost on you, you are indeed lost. Stand still. The forest knows where you are. You must let it find you. Okay, let's um, we'll have our final lay down together as it were, even though we're not our virtual togetherness. So transitioning to your resting. Posture.
We're just laying still for a little bit longer. Just recollecting, remembering that's what went on when you were laying down. Finding the breath in your body, and remembering your body to itself. Make a simple connect commitment, simple commitment to your breath, just to stay aware of breathing as you make the transition from laying down back to sitting. So no rush in your own time. Come back to your meditation. So taking the time to establish the posture. Imagine making your posture between the earth and the sky. And your body like a great tree. Reaching down into the earth. Reaching up into the sky. Light coming down from above, from the rich, dark earth, moist, rising up from below. Perhaps these energies, you can imagine these different energies, the sky energy, earth energy, kind of mixing, crossing in the heart, in the chamber of the heart. So we're drawing sky down to earth and releasing earth up into sky. Don't try and force anything to happen. It's just images we use to activate the psyche and the psyche is the ocean of ourselves. But naturally participate in the universal and do its work. Our role as good alchemists, if you like, is just to tend and attend to the posture, to the same present. We'll kind of trust in this process. Can't make things happen in a willed or forced way. Need to relax, pay kind attention. Of 
Yeah, the breath work, the body from the inside, opening and softening, releasing. You can bring your knowledge of your own body to play. Knowing to check where we are holding in the face, whether the spine is kind of clapped, too much tension in the chest, where we're left holding in the butter and the thighs, whether the feet and hands are soft and alive. Whether you're aware of your root, whether you're aware of your back center, and so on up to you can bring a kind of gentle. guidance into it if you like or you can just let it get on let it get on by itself so to speak and you're just attending with kindness always with kindness yeah what kindness kin what closer to the cherish what close to world if you like. So just uh, sitting together, sitting with your own experience, sitting with a knowledge of the world around you, the other people share this experience with I remember rightly we started with a little poem I might be wrong my memory so it's a kind of a, you know we've got a special evening with a kind of still Coming back to the beginning, always coming back to the beginning. Here's the roomy out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing. There is a field. I will meet you there. When the soul lays down in that grass, the world is too full to think of. Ideas, language, even the notion of one another make no sense.
we'll leave it there for this morning. Um, if you're able to come along with evening work. I will attempt to uh, respond to your questions that you might have.